You know, this, this class on the book of Revelation, it's not, it's not uh, the ordinary teaching that you normally hear. Uh, my goal is to emphasize the Lord. My goal is to emphasize the reality of the nature and the spirit of Christ. Um, to know him and to be able to see him in different settings and recognize him instead of being surprised um, because we, we heard lessons about him, but we never gained the perspective to be able to say, hey, I think that might be Jesus. <clears throat> so anyway, our hearts are for the Lord and we do love the Lord. And so that's my emphasis here. We're in Revelation chapter five. And uh, and let's read verse 5, or starting with verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. <clears throat> um, well, let's go ahead and read just a few more down. And when he had taken the scroll, or the book, the four and living creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open its seals, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, has made unto us, unto our God, a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth. All right, a couple of things that I'll usually point out when I'm in these scriptures is in verse 9, it makes this statement, for thou hast redeemed us to God. It's a common thing that I share out of these scriptures. It doesn't say thou hast redeemed us from hell or thou hast redeemed us from punishment. These people that are around the throne that are, that are viewing and looking at the lamb see something higher than what they were brought out of. They're seeing what they've been brought into. And it's not just getting away from something, running from something, being delivered from something. And folks, when you're going through stuff, I mean, I, I know, um, you know, years ago, many, many, many years ago, my wife and I felt like um, uh, that the Lord might move us on from a place that we were at at the time. Um, and at that place and with the leadership, there were many, 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 many problems. And so the, when they would rise up, you know, like a tide, like the tide would rise up, and we'd go, look at these problems, and we need to, you know, we need to go. Um, and the Lord dealt with me. He, he literally shared with me. He said, don't ever, don't ever leave anything. He said, go to my son. If you can't leave something on the way to your going to Jesus, then don't leave. And that was... A, well, that was revolutionary for me because, you know, I mean, the kind of the way we are is, you know, you, well, I don't, I don't like this person, so you run from them or, or kill them, you know what I mean? Or, uh, or you, you know, you don't like um, the situation that you're in and you run from it. I know many times when people are going through, like me, physical trials, they want to they want to run to the Lord, but they're really not running to the Lord. They're running to the Lord to get away from the physical junk. And so, you know, you go and you do all this stuff to get away from it. <clears throat> but in reality, the answer, the always answer, 
is that we run to Jesus. And whether, whether he heals me or whether he fixes my situation is not the issue. I want Jesus. I want to get to Jesus. My heart's for the Lord. And I'd rather be a cripple at the feet of Jesus, you know, than, uh, than healthy and not have a heart for the Lord. And so it doesn't matter to me how I look to people uh, or what lack I seem to have, I, you know. What matters is that the Lord know, that he knows, and that I know that my number one priority is to be with him and I don't care about anything else. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care about loss. I don't care. I care about the Lord. And I do believe that if I put the Lord first, that he'll take care of whatever, not just my needs. You know, we always go, well, all these things should be added to me. But that, I, that he will take care of everybody else too, you know. <clears throat> and um, so anyway, I, you know, I don't want to go off on that for a long time. But just this this reality, I mean, how many people have the reality that we've been redeemed to something? We've been redeemed to God, not just away from the devil, you know, oh, you know. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, there was another thing. Oh, just the way this is worded, and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And, and the wording there, very specific, that we were redeemed to God out of but look at the wording there. It says we were redeemed to God, not out of hell, out of punishment. We were redeemed to God out of every tongue and kindred and people and nation. Folks, we were, joined, we were redeemed out of that to become the next verse, a kingdom of priests. Okay? That, that I mean, literally we have been. I mean, in, a, in the most real way, we were redeemed to be out of that, more importantly, out of that so that we might be the priests. And a priest in those days wasn't anything like a priest today. A priest in those days, their number one job was to offer the lamb to God for acceptance, to please him, for, for, for thanks, for all of these things, it was the death of the Lamb. It was, as it were, Christ crucified that is being offered through us to him, spiritual sacrifices. And, um, you know, I mean, uh, the thank offering, you didn't thank God. You didn't, go, you didn't go in the temple and go, thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you, thank you. If you're really thankful, you offered the Lamb. That was your worship. I mean, that, that was your worship. That's how you worshiped, you know. And uh, so that's what this is stating. And this is stating that in light of the Lamb and in light of this new song that they're singing, uh, and it, it's interesting that it's called a new song because we all know songs similar to this, but do we know what this song really is all about? Um, and... Um, So, so I'm going to read part of this again to you, and I want you to just listen to me reading it instead of you reading it. It says, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open its seals, for thou wast slain. And the word slain there is the word slaughtered. Thou art worthy because thou wast slaughtered. Well, wait a minute. What kind of deal is that? You know, I mean, who gets honored? Who gets... Who gets, um, you know, who gets a throne? Who gets a, a um, heavenly, uh, uh, the angels, the heavenly host worshiping on the ground that, you know, you are worthy because you were slain? I mean, think about it. It's pretty, it's really 
will shake you up if you really see it for what it's saying because it is not just saying, well, he died on the cross for us. It's not honoring the, anything about in that sense of what we usually put into it. It is, in fact, that was pretty good right there. Thou art worthy because thou was slaughtered. It, that's, all, that's the basic thing that it's, it's saying there. And that means that you have to view many of the New Testament scriptures in a different light than we have formerly viewed them. We've always viewed them in what it meant for us, you know. Um, uh, I was thinking about uh, Isaiah 53, you know, as Sunday I, I uh, read from that, and I know many of you are watching this that were watching it then, <clears throat> and I plan on putting those translations that I read to you Sunday morning in the next newsletter uh, so that you'll have them if, if you want those. It'll be available. And those who don't get the newsletter, just let me know and I'll get you a copy <clears throat> um, of the, of the uh, translations. But uh, it said, you know, he was wounded for our transgressions. And, you know, all I've ever seen, not, not fully seen, but is he was wounded for my transgressions. In other words, I had to be in there. But all of a sudden I just read he was wounded. I mean, this is the Son of God. This is God come down in human form and he was wounded. And he did it. You know, we get wounded and we don't like it. We don't want it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, because we go, you know, but he was wounded for, you know, and intentionally took that. Um, uh, my mind just was wandering on that, or I don't know if you call it wandering or being led of the Holy Spirit, but I was thinking about how um, Jesus, uh, he said uh, that that the Father hath given me commandment that I can, I, can, I can lay down my life or I can take it again. I don't have to do this. I'm a willing sacrifice. I know what I'm doing. I'm for this method. I'm for this. I believe in this way. Okay? Uh, and then, then Peter says, you know, when he starts talking there in Matthew 16 about dying on the cross and all this kind of stuff, Peter stops him and says, you know, not so, Lord, this isn't, you know, and Jesus sounds a little upset. He's certainly a little more uh, lively when he says, uh, get behind me, Satan, <laughs> talking to Peter. And he uh, says, because thou savest the things that be of God, of man instead of God. And, and it sounds like Jesus is upset like somebody's trying to de deter him from God's way. You know, appealing to stuff within you. Save yourself. Don't let them do this to you. Don't, anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. Well, if you're a willing sacrifice, they're not doing it to you. That's right. But, but Jesus really defended this way, you know. And then I thought also of that scripture where it says that Jesus, you know, uh, he, you know, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and it was, you know, now is my soul troubled. And that it was not easy. That it was hard. And that when he just thought of the way, he knew it would be hard. But when he thought of somebody trying to deter him from this way, he got more oomph. Is that, you know, it's like, well, I mean, no, those things were just affecting me as I saw Jesus. This is, an, this is our Lord. This is the one that we love. He was there in that situation and, you know, come down from the cross. And he ain't going to do it, man. And not going to do it. Is he having fun up there? Does it feel good? Does the lashing, does all the stuff that's happened to him uh, please him at that moment? No. But he understands that life comes out of death. And he understands that if he's going to demonstrate the true reality of God, he can't come down from that cross, you know. 
And again, a long time ago, I shared, uh, you know, that scripture that says, um, um, it talks about come down from the cross, and it says, uh, you, they said to him, you saved others, you cannot save yourself while he's hanging on the cross. And I remember the Lord speaking to my heart on that. And he said, you know what? That guy didn't know the Lord at all, but he was right on because you can't, you cannot save yourself while you're saving others. You can't do it. You have to lose yourself to save others. That's the spirit and the nature of Christ crucified. You have to. And he said, well, he saved others. He cannot save himself. And Jesus isn't hurt by that. He's going, yeah, that's right. This is the way this works, you know. This doesn't offend me, you know. Um, but he was an enigma to all those people that were mocking him, trying to get him to come down from the cross because everybody wants to save themselves. Yep, that's it. Yep. Well, everyone but him. He, so my point is that he knew what he was doing. This needs to be clear in our minds, folks. This can't just be a teaching, and it can't be my teaching, because I don't. It's not. It is not my teach. I teach it, but it's not my teaching. <laughs> this was around, you know, way back when they first founded this thing. When Jesus died on the cross and was back before the eternal ages to come, it is the selflessness of God. And, if, and of his way. And we will revert. It's an automatic, folks. Our default within our nature is to revert to self-survival and, and protection. It is. And to resist the very thing that Jesus embraced as the way. And, and I understand that. That's why I don't fault anybody for doing that. I mean, I, I, there are people who hate me for ever suggesting that they lose anything or whatever. But, you know, it's the way I see it. It's Christ. Jesus will be self-giving. And I can't live any other way, and I can't preach anything different, though, as you know. I mean, I, I do not put this on you. I teach it to you. But I expect you to put it on me, and I expect you to hold me to, you know, nobody else around here, but hold me to laying down my life and, and losing for your gain. Because I'm not, see, that doesn't freak me out. Well, they'll be watching every moment, and if you don't do it, good, point something out. If it's not the Lord, I want to know. I'm not, af I'm not afraid of that. That's what I want. That's what that's what's so funny about it. I want you to do that. Oh, oh we couldn't tell Brother Randy that he's a hypocrite. If, you th if you, that's the way you see it, you tell me. Because I want the Lord. And, and I know that you do too, but I'm just saying, this is not my place to put this on you. It's my place to teach it. And if the Lord speaks to you over it, then follow him in it. And if he doesn't, be free to be, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it like this, although it's not, you know, but be free to be as selfish as you want, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that is between you and God. That's n I'm nobody. I'm nobody. I'm a pastor of a few little sheep, and I just, I just want to, I just want to walk with my, my Lord, and I just want to be faithful to what he's called me to do as much as I know how. Anyway, I'm going to quit talking. I'm going to read some, because... Because uh, it's beautiful work behind me, but it won't be long and we'll be out of time. Here. <clears throat> All right. In Revelation 5, they are also confronted with another reality. And, and they're confronted in the person of a slaughtered lamb. That, and that reality is that of God's power demonstrated through weakness. There's the one who won. Folks, there's the one who won, the one who they ran over and slaughtered. And they're honoring that. <laughs> uh, the picture given, to, given them of the worshiped lamb was meant to define things in terms of God's view. I'm showing you this. I'm showing you that heaven honors this. What? A defeated guy who didn't fight back and let him accuse him of stuff he never did, and he didn't, he didn't strike them all down, and he had the power, and he could have, and this is it? 
Yes. Yes. Uh, the Greek word translated slain in Revelation 5, 6, and 9 imply a violent death, for thou wast slain. That's why I use the word slaughtered, and in many places it's translated slaughtered. Um, thou wast slaughtered. When you gather these thoughts together, you come away with the fact that God is actually exalting a defeated, slaughtered lamb victimized by those in power. Victimized by those. That's what God's honoring. I mean, that's revolutionary. No, we've heard it before. <laughs> we heard it last semester in First Corinthians. <laughs> it's amazing. It's just amazing. When you look at the lamb, you're actually viewing, what are you looking at? You're looking at Christ crucified. You're looking at the guy that came, became incarnated, the, he's the son of God, and you're looking at him slain, slaughtered, defeated, defenseless, innocent, and power rising up around him and controlling the situation and him not resisting it but him knowing that this is the way to bring their downfall. <clears throat> All right. So in Revelation, John uses one word for lamb. All right. It's not the usual word. Uh, usually the word uh, lamb that is used throughout the scriptures is a word in the, in the uh, Greek is arnos or Arion, it's, that's an equivalent. There's several different equivalents of it, but it's Arion. <clears throat> but here, it's even smaller. It's, less, it's a less pronounced version of the lamb. This mighty conqueror is less than even a regular little lamb. Um, I'm sorry, it is, it is, the normal word is Arnos, and the word that it uses here is Arion. And, and I always think of Spanish, you know, like this, where you know, somebody like your son's name is Michael and they would call him Miguel. But if you really wanted to so, show a sweet, dear little, you know, the sweet, dear littleness of him, you'd call him Miguelito. And it's a little ending on the end that signifies that it's even more dear, more sweet, but in this sense, even more small and more weak. Okay, so, um, so this mighty conqueror is being called a Arion, and it's less than even a regular little lamb. <laughs> okay, um, and and that word is used of us in uh, Luke chapter ten and verse three, where it says that you are as lambs among wolves. It means you're just little, defenseless, smaller than a lamb. You're a, you're a preemie lamb, <laughs> a preemie. <laughs> you are just a little preemie lamb. And if you want to get a picture of what that looks like, go over and see little Zeke, because he's just a little preemie guy. <clears throat> um, so you're forced by using that word for that, that imagery that God is giving them, um, you're forced to acknowledge that the lion of the tribe of Judah the destroyer of the mighty, uh, let's see, how did I word that? The, the line of the tribe of Judah, the destroyer of the mighty beast of the book, in the book of Revelation is found to be a miniature version of a baby sheep. The lamb that destroys the beasts <laughs> is this little miniature version of a baby sheep. And, that, and they're having to look at that. Now, I don't know, we, we can sit here, we're, it's you know, way down the road and everything, and we don't have, we're not seeing it as God goes, look at this. But if you look at it for what it is, you see that all of heaven and what has been joined to it is focused on one thing. It's a slaughtered, miniature version of a lamb. And this is being presented as the great and mighty conqueror of beasts. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, 
he is not in, in, endued with supernatural powers or abilities to defeat, meaning he has no natural defenses that he's given. You know, a lot of animals do. You know, they're given all sorts of things. I mean, even things that look weak, you know, like the, the box jellyfish. Anybody familiar with the, the box jellyfish in, in um, down under <laughs> Australia? You get into there and touch that thing, you got, it's, you've got like seconds to get some help or you're going to die, and most people die from it. Okay. This is a jellyfish, for God's sake. He's, he's got no backbone. Well, God, yeah, it's way worse than that. But, but the lamb doesn't have that, you know. Um, so since he's, endued, he's not endued with uh, any of these powers or abilities to defeat, to look at him compared to the beast. Now, the only way to see this is to, I can't read the book, full book of Revelation to you right now, but the only way to see this is to picture the beast, picture the red dragon, picture the false prophet, picture their power, picture their control, picture all of this stuff, and, um, um, and now compare them in their power and in their great swellingness to this slaughtered. Lamette. <laughs> what? Lambkin. Well, ours are the lamettes. All right. And so that's what I did. That's when I realized what John and what Jesus through this imagery there of, of Revelation 5 was trying to convey to the seven churches who were going through so much junk and in defeat in so many ways and wondering what's wrong and we love the Lord. Why am I having these problems? Why is God not changing my situation? Why is this happening? <clears throat> I was forced to look at his answer that when Jesus came down, he didn't, first of all, he didn't even have to come down. All he had to do is show up, you know, in the sky and, you know, just go poof, and all of his enemies would melt like slugs. That's all he had to do. Well, why wouldn't you do that? Well, if you're God, and everybody seems to know God in this way, but they don't know him as lamb, they don't know him as, as self-giving to the point of death for others, and so they're expecting, and I understand that. I mean, I'm not against that, and I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying, you know, if that's our expectation, that the mighty one, the Messiah, when he appears, he's going to take these Romans away. He's going to take this mighty nation that controls everything, the commerce and the religion and everything. And, you know, and he's going, he's going to defeat everything. And then they defeat him and slaughter him on a cross. That's got to be shocking. It's got to be. Well, folks, we experience that today when we expect him to come rushing in and fix everything and do great, incredible things and whatever. And when he doesn't do it, instead of saying, oh, God, I want to know you, I, I would never want to um, accuse you because I love you too much. But I'm having doubts, and the doubts are probably my fault, not yours. Open my eyes. Well... That's, that's, that's a true heart for the Lord. You know what I'm saying? But you know, in the meantime, your friends will wander by and go, well, if you're really of God, you wouldn't be suffering with this right now. You'd be going, you know, and no, no, I, you know, my father knows what's best for me. You know, I've told a story a long time ago of the, there was this classroom of, of um, blind kids and deaf, uh, let's see, was it, oh, they were dumb, they couldn't speak. And they were invited to a school where there were young kids, in fact, I think it was a girls' school and it was all girls, and so the, the, 
the uh, dumb girls were brought into this school and they were sitting there and so different ones were getting up and trying to encourage these girls and stuff like that and one of them one of the girls just being insensitive says well I wonder why God would would let us be born perfect and y'all have problems and there was just a shock that went through the room and of course the teachers and everything just went oh my god you know and uh, one little girl got up and went to the chalkboard because she didn't know how to speak and she wrote on a scripture on this chalkboard and it says for even so it seemed good in thy sight O lord You know, and then all the the perfect girls kind of went, you know what I mean? And, you know, folks, we look at flaws and failures and weakness and troubles and everything. We look at, we look at them as, as lepers when maybe they're finding the Lord in ways we never could yes. because we're so strong in ourselves and not strong in the Lord. Yes. Right. May we find the Lord and may it not have to you know be because of those things but if those things come let them be gifts and treasures to get our heart even more to the Lord let them you know don't let them be enemies you know let them be blessings from the Lord <clears throat> all right so um, to look at him compared to the beast the slaughter is evident because he is weak and vulnerable this lamb did not, and here's the deal, he's, he's being glorified, there's this throne, there's this, there's this crowd, there's these elders, there's the angels, there's all this stuff going on. He is being glorified to the highest degree that any of these seven churches could ever imagine. And this lamb did not win a glorious battle, which ended a war, but was actually totally annihilated in battle. I mean, you know, if you're going to go to a movie, folks, <laughs> you know, you, you want to see the win, you want to win in the end, and you want to defeat the enemies, and you want to shame them or kill them or, you know, get revenge on them or something like that. Well, Jesus' story now didn't end, but it appeared to end like he went to war, this little lamb running across the battlefield, you know, you know, I mean, one side they're all the, the, the brave heart. Ah, they got all these weapons and ah, you know, mad heathen hordes rushing madly, and on the other side, this little lamb going. Bah, bah, and you're kind of going, oh boy, this is not going to end well, <laughs> you know. But that's exactly what happened. But he def he defeated them in his death. But we don't, do, you know, do we want to go the way of the Lamb? Well, we do if we understand it all. We shouldn't want to if we don't. Do you understand? We, it's not normal to want that unless there's something wrong with you. But if you see through Lamb's eyes, if you see this the way he sees it, then if you had a choice when you would go up against beasts, You would choose the lamb. That's what you'd do. All right. So, again, I'll read this last one. This lamb did not win a glorious battle, which ended a war, but was actually totally annihilated in battle. To the amazement of all, he has won by being defenseless, vulnerable, and weak. That's how he won. Revelation 5, 6, and 7. Thou was slaughtered. Now I'm familiar with some worship songs that sing Revelation 5, and there's this one song, and it's really glorious, and it, it the way it rises to the, and it gets to the point of Thou was slain, Thou was slain, and it's just like, oh, yes, He died on the cross, and we see that in a completely different light. But if we sing, Thou was slaughtered, they totally won, <laughs> they beat up fool out of you and go praise God
because in that slaughter was the victory. Um, so, okay, but here's the other thing we have to see in those scriptures. When it says, thou wast slain, remember now, this is talking about the book of Revelation. Thou was slaughtered shows what the beast did to him. Do you understand? That's what it's, it's picturing. I'm not talking about the, the specific fellows of Revelation. I'm talking about the beast, whether it's the Roman Empire that is controlling everything and, or it's, you know, something in our world today or I'm talking about the beast. I'm talking about that which is controlled by its own lust and its own gain and it's still, you know, that spirit is here. And many people, even now in our society, feel like they're under the pressure of something huge and bigger than they are and controlling and everything's starting to feel more and more out of control. I mean, do you agree that there's sort of a sense of that, at least in society, whether we've come to that yet or not? Um, so, uh, so when it says thou was slaughtered, it's speaking of what the beast did to him. And the word slain speaks of violence by means of mighty weapons. However, the multitudes are saying these words with honor and with jubilation. Thou was slain. They're, they're, this is honor. They're not going, oh, darn, we lost. They're honoring that death. They're honoring, can I say it like this? They're honoring that slaughter. Okay, you know why? Because they are up above. They're no longer the seven churches on the earth in, in where their comprehension is coming from. Remember all the bad things said to the, each of the churches and how they were, they were Satan's seat and all this stuff and Satan's throne? Well, now they're gathered around this throne. Now they see themselves there honoring that, that specific one. And all of a sudden, the victory is filling the place. It's totally unlike what the seven churches had been experiencing in the first three books. Now all of a sudden, they're up. Now all of a sudden, they're above. Now all of a sudden, they see the object of God's victory is a slain lamb, not just a lamb, a slaughtered lamb. And they've had a little more experience with it than we have. They've slaughtered lamb after lamb after lamb, year after year, feast after feast, sin after sin. And they saw that that was their victory. So this isn't as big a shock to them as it is to us. <laughs> it's like, we know this. You know, when we walk away from that altar, the victory has been won. All right, how much time we got here? So, uh, uh, another subtitle here, The Significance of Revelation 5 for the Seven Churches, which I've just spent several moments sharing on. <clears throat> what is the significance of this heavenly scene for the beleaguered seven churches of the previous chapters? Remember, John delivered this letter to churches who were tempted to lean to the wisdom and power of this age, or they were about to fall into dis despair over their own weaknesses and their own helplessness in the face of overwhelming forces. They had been waiting for the victory to come to them in the form of the Messiah, who would be the seed of David, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. However, this far into their walk with the Lord, and they saw no real changes, no glorious kingdom, no outward victory. The apostle was not unsympathetic with their plight, speaking of John who wrote this, <clears throat> for he began this letter to them while himself in exile and imprisonment on the Isle of Patmos, Revelation 1.9. We find the church in Thessalonica to be in a similar state of oppression resulting in discouragement and and uh, I don't know, I, don't, I see maybe one or two pins, but um, 
You can read First and Second Thessalonians to find this. I've, there's actually a bunch of scriptures I have here that just show the same thing, you know. And and Paul is saying that you're. Oh gosh, let me let me look up one. First Thessalonians uh, two. First Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were shamefully treated as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our, in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with, with much contention. He says, but you know that it wasn't in vain. You know that you guys ended up coming to the Lord. You know that the victory was won. You know that in, in the midst of this contention and this problems and this persecution that we were experiencing, you know for yourself that it was just the same picture of Christ again. The same picture of loss to bring about gain. <clears throat> and he says, it's not, it's not in vain. It's not in vain. What does that mean? There is a power behind it. It's not powerless. <clears throat> That's where the mistake comes from. We don't see the power behind it. And, and therefore, I don't blame anybody for not taking this road. If, they, if you don't see that, that there is power behind it, don't do it. Because, you know, I would, you know, I don't think the Lord's advocating just go get slaughtered in vain. I think there is a power behind selfless giving, folks. You say, well, where do you get that from? The cross. I mean, it's just, just came to me. Maybe that would be a good place to look <clears throat> as the symbol of what Christianity is supposed to be. <clears throat> you know, I mean, I've often thought why didn't they, you know, when I was younger, why didn't they just make sort of a little stone, little, little slight hill with a little opening and a little rolled away stone beside it for the resurrection? And we all walk around instead of crosses, we wore that. You say, well, it'd be, it'd be too bulky. We're going to go with the cross. The cross is more bulky, folks, the real one. <laughs> You know, <clears throat> but the, the resurrection isn't the sign of the victory. The resurrection is the result of the victory. All right. So uh, this imagery before the throne is supposed to be a picture of the seven churches so that they might view themselves in the place of victory. But as they looked at this grand spectacle, they probably felt far from such a reality. They might have questioned how could how some could worship the Lamb while their lives were in such turmoil, under pressure and beat down. But that's the one they're worshiping, turmoil, pressure and beat down. You know, if you can't see it in Him, you know, <clears throat> the answer is this can only happen if they see the Lamb rightly and embrace His method of dealing with oppression, which is by means of defeat and death. But where would one get eyes such as this? How can those who are depressed, defeated, discouraged, break free from a defeatist mentality? It begins with grasping what John is trying to convey. First by the letters to these churches under oppression in the first several chapters and then by worshipers before the Lamb. After confirming their pitiful state, then, then the seven churches are given in Revelation 5 an immediate picture of victory and joy before the enthroned Lamb. The Lamb in the midst of the throne. What's the meaning? What is the meaning of taking them through their problems, their failures, the enemy, the attacks, the different things that have infiltrated them, and then showing them this imagery of heavenly reality? <clears throat> this lamb must be enthroned as life. 
inside of us. And then we must honor it above all else. Many are able to honor the Lamb of Salvation without making him their life. Oh, I honor your way as long as it only saves me from something. I honor your selfless way, your defeat. I honor your defeat as long as I benefit from it. But don't ask me to order my life after it. Well, okay, I'm not. You figured out if the Lord's asking you to. But I'm not. I'm not asking you to order your life after it. First of all, it's not your life. It's his life. And if you're truly born again, then that life will order itself. <laughs> but that's, that's, another, that's another thing that's between you and God. All right. Okay. I feel pretty good. I feel like we're, we're making a little progress on this class. We'll quit a little bit early so that we don't run over too much the next one. So let's take a little break.